Well, welcome. Welcome to our service, our Ascension Day service, and for everybody who's able to join us. This is one of those strange services that we have on our Christian calendar, and I say strange only because it's on a Thursday, and it's no longer a public holiday. So it used to be many, many years ago, and so we would always have a church service, and you'd look forward to it, and then over the years, uh, it became one where only those who weren't working would, would come along, and we would often have our school that would be here for the Ascension Day service, and then we get to lockdown and COVID-19, and again, it's just different. So now it's this strange thing of not having anybody here, but yet we do have you joining us online. And it's not a public holiday, but a lot of people are still at home. So it's strange from that perspective. We get to celebrate, though, one of the most understated events on our Christian calendar. And that's really what we want to discover uh, together this morning, is to say, where does this fit in and what is the significance of the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ? And so as we get to do that together, I'm going to ask that we are going to open in prayer, and then we're going to have a song that we're going to sing together, one that speaks about God's greatness and His majesty. So I'm, I'm going to ask that you join with me in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity of being reminded of who you are, of what you have done. And Father, that because of your love for each and every one of us, you did not leave us alone in our darkness and in our sin. But Father, you sent your Son into this world as broken as what it is that he stepped down and took on human form to accomplish your work. And Father, today we are reminded that that work was finished by the Lord Jesus Christ and that you glorified him by raising him from the dead and that he has ascended to be at your right hand. And so, Father, today we pray that you would make those spiritual realities a reality to us personally and that we would be able to see life from a different perspective because of the incredible work that you have done. And Father, amidst all of the chaos and the turmoil that we are having to deal with, with our routines that are unsettled, with all of the securities that we would normally hold on to, whether that be our finances, our job security, our family security, our freedom that we would take for granted, with all of those things unsettled and shaken, Father, we know where our true security comes from. That we anchor our lives not on anything in this world, but we anchor our lives on you as your children. And you ask us to trust you and you alone. And so, Father, may this remind us of that incredible gift of your love and of your grace that you have bestowed upon us, that we can call you our Father, and that we can be your children, and that we can trust in you above everything else. As we thank you for this and ask your blessing in the name above every other name, the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We well, thank you. We're going to join together in singing one of the favorite songs of the church, uh, how great thou art. And I'm going to ask that wherever you might be, that you join with us in song. Thank you.
thank you. I hope that you enjoyed singing that as much as what I did. Um, this morning is, is different, as I've mentioned, not just because it's Ascension Day, but it's also different because it's the first time that we're live streaming our service um, since lockdown. And live stream is different from what we've been doing previously. So the interaction right now is live. We've also encouraged everybody to move on to our church online platform. And the reason for that is because it facilitates the, the live environment a lot better than what YouTube does. So I think for those who, who might not be familiar with our, our church online platform, it's the same video stream. It's just the framework that changes, the comments and the, the things that are available for us to interact with you. Uh, those change. And one of those is being able to show appreciation. So what I've got, I've actually got our church online platform running live on my iPad. If I write a comment in here and I say, hello, everyone, you will see this come up in real time. It will be slightly delayed, but you will see it eventually. And so when I post this and it comes up, I'm hoping that you're going to show some appreciation for it. So I say hello to everybody, and to show appreciation, you click on the little heart, and there goes one heart, and I can see the heart in real time, and there goes another heart. And everybody that shows the appreciation, we get that instant feedback. So when I have to share the service to an empty church, it's different because we don't get the body language. We don't get the, the facial expressions. We don't get the, the amen or the... Uh, Hallelujahs, not that we normally get many of those, but the well said or the uh huh, we get a lot of those. Maybe even some yarn near, sometimes some of those as well. But we don't get that when the church is empty. Our online platform allows us to receive that feedback. So as I make this next announcement, I'm hoping to see a whole lot of hearts and a whole lot of appreciation as I welcome um, the person who's going to be joining me in our Ascension Day service, and that is Dr. Bruce. Willard, so you can give appreciation by showing us some hearts, and I can show Bruce as the hearts start flowing. And that's everybody saying, welcome, Bruce. And as they type in the comments, we'll be able to see that. So, Bruce, um, you might need to take the mask off. I don't know that we're going to hear. I will social distance, so I will give some space so that we keep, we keep that space and everyone can see your beard, which is great. So, welcome, Bruce. Well, great. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. It's really super to be with you and uh, very unique as Warren has pointed out, but we trust this is going to be very beneficial to everyone. Uh, this is a very exciting uh, subject that we're dealing with in terms of the ascension. It is such an important one. There are five definite reasons why the ascension um, is particularly important to us as believers, Warren. That's right. So, Bruce, we want to have a look at what the purpose of the ascension really is for us as Christians and why we say that this is significant. So, in the significance of the, the ascension, there is um, a change. There's a shift. So, I'm, I'm in my yearly reading plan. I'm in the Gospels at the moment. And I'm reading through how the Lord was walking with his disciples and how he kept trying to tell them, you know, what's going to come and sort of giving them that, that foresight into that he has to go, he has to die, he's going to be raised again. And they were blinded, so humanly blinded, but spiritually blinded as well because it wasn't revealed to them at that time. But for them, their reality was what they were experiencing. They were walking with the Lord, having all of the miracles and the things that were happening and, and expecting him to be the Messiah. His death, so his crucifixion and his resurrection, were major shifts in their thinking. But so was the ascension. So the ascension was another one of those massive paradigm shifts that they had to deal with. So they were thinking, you know, this is the road that we're going. We're going to establish the kingdom and it's going to be like this and we're with, with the Messiah and then the whole Passover weekend and everything that happens and then the 40 days because that's really where we are now. It's the 40 days post the resurrection. So what happened in those 40 days? Bruce, just a brief overview. Well, look how the Lord had actually risen from the dead. 
He had made his appearance to the disciples. Yeah. He had made himself real to over 500 followers. So one often thinks he just revealed himself to the 12. Mm. But the scriptures actually indicate that there were more than 500 folks who had actually witnessed the resurrected Lord. And during that 40-day period, uh, there were conferences that he held with them in preparing them for the future. Sure. Yeah. And therefore, he takes them to the Mount of Olives uh, just outside Jerusalem. And uh, then he tells them, it's necessary, as I've told you before, that I go away. If Do I you don't think go they away, believed it? Do you think they believed that it was going to happen? Well, I, I think they believed it, but they didn't know how it was or, going to actually happen. Or when, happen. exactly? So yes, they'd... yes, they, they, they didn't really know at that yeah. particular point. And, um, but when they were conversing with him, after 40 days of him speaking about the kingdom, obviously that is a, a primary thought in their mind. And mm. at this time, they actually ask him about the kingdom. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom now? Mm still expecting, well, we've been together 40 years, um, sorry, 40 days, mm. and the Lord is now going to establish the kingdom as has mm. been promised in the Old Testament. Sure. And what he's actually told us in that 40-day conference, well, maybe it's going to happen now. And then uh, suddenly, oh, the he, he ascends. He ascends. And yeah. as he ascends, of course, the messenger, uh, two messengers actually say that the same way that he's ascended, he will so in like manner return and descend mm to the Mount of Olives. And that's, of course, his second coming when he'll come back again. But the big question, the big issue here, is that they ask him about the kingdom, and he said, it's not given to you to know the times now, mm. but that will be revealed to you. Go back to Jerusalem and be the witnesses that I've called you to be. So, Bruce, I mean, as humans, we, we often conjure up our own expectations and our own plans mm. as to how things are going to be revealed or how it's going to pan out. And I think that's always the challenge is for us to take our plans and then to say, but what is God's plan and what is his purpose? So like for the disciples, the, the Lord's divine plan, which he can't, he's not going to veer off that plan sure. because I mean, that's part of prophecy. It's part of God's word. Yet the disciples, they weren't on that same plan. So it had to happen like that. He had to ascend and he had to leave. Sure. And he had promised that yes. it's going to happen. Yes. And that's when the comforter was going to come. Correct. So there's no other way that it can happen. Yes. Yet it still catches them by surprise. Yes, it seems that they had difficulty in processing that. And, and the time frame, the chronological order in which yeah. this would actually happen. I think that uh, that's, that caught them by a surprise, no doubt. Because as you know, in the Old Testament... There's no mention of the ascension except in the Psalms mm -hmm. where it says that the Lord will um, say to our Lord, there are two lords there, which yeah. is God the Father and God the Son. Um, they would communicate. So the Psalms anticipates it, but it's not very clear. It's actually implied, but it's not very explicit. And um, so the disciples really didn't know that. And I, I think what, what really is very relevant to us, as you rightly point out, and that is we have our expectations of mm. the way things are going to pan out. And uh, it doesn't come as, God surpri as a surprise to God when he begins to change um, and uh, ch change our way of thinking. Mm. But when that actually happens, it, it is a great shock. I, ca I can imagine. They, yeah. they must have been absolutely staggered. Can you imagine them going back after the ascension back to Jerusalem and talking about it? I'm sure there was like... Days of just bewilderment, silence. yeah. No, totally, totally bewilderment. What, what is going to happen now? And you know, Bruce, I think often personally when you, you face a major change that you don't expect and you don't understand initially, mm. you're left in that state mm. of, but why? Why is this happening Correct. right now? Correct. Whether that be a personal health crisis, whether it be a personal uh, financial crisis, whether it be a personal family crisis, whatever it might be. Be it a pandemic. <laughs> or a pandemic, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I, that's what I was leading up to. Sure. Is, you know, we're facing this now and yeah. we're saying, yeah, but Lord, but why? Like surely this, this is not part of your plan and sure. you know, you're not going to be able to work through this. This is the end. Yeah. You know, this is a disaster. Yeah. Sure. And it's just to be able to see mm. that even when it is so clearly God's plan, we still battle with it. Very much so. To, to understand how God's going to do it. Yeah. And you just need that little bit of time. And in between there, it's filled with trust. So you have to trust that God is going to be using it because he always has. That's never changed. Sure. 
and then you start seeing, ah, and that's really what we want to get to. Sure. What, and what it accomplished. 100% right. And I think the commodity of time, which you and I are, and, and every person is in action fact limited by past, present, and future, uh, we lose sight of the fact that God is eternal. So time is not a factor when it comes yeah. to God. The only reason why he speaks about time is to associate so that we can associate with him. Yeah. But God does not work according to our timetable. Yeah. Uh, because God is eternal. He walk, works according to his eternal plan and his eternal program. Sure. And in our humanity, we're very limited and finite in that we cannot really conceive of that. And God in his wisdom hasn't revealed it all to us except that which he wants us to know. For but, good reason. Correct. <laughs> and, and, and often once the situation occurs and we look back retrospectively in hindsight, ah, oh, now the penny drops. So you can imagine the disciples were in exactly the same situation that many people are in. But Bruce, I know in the beginning, we, I don't want to veer off too much, but had God revealed at the time that we asked the full picture, it wouldn't be the same. Of course not. You wouldn't get to that point later of understanding in that same way. So it's the process that has to happen. And there's so much value hmm. in not knowing Sure. And having to wait and having to trust and having to rely on the Lord. Correct. And that's what you're robbed of Correct. should God just reveal it to you. You'll have the information, Absolutely. but not the transformation. Right. And, and in, if it becomes a reality, where is the trust element? It, yeah. it, it, it trust is uh, it's faith. And faith is an anticipation of what is going to happen. And trusting that God will pan it all out at the end. And I think that that is the wonderful security that we have. But what, yeah. and I think getting back to um, the ascension and one of the big reasons was that Jesus actually accomplished his earthly mission, except mm. of course when he comes back and finalizes the kingdom. Yeah. But he had accomplished the purpose for which he had come. And I think that, that often folks don't see that as one of the important reasons why he ascended, mm. because he had done the work. Mm. The work that he came to accomplish on earth has been accomplished. It is a finished work. So on the cross, he said, it is finished. The plan of mm. salvation was finished. Mm. But there were so many other loose ends that uh, needed to be tied up in the minds of his followers. Yeah. And he spent those 40 days explaining to them, guys, don't be too disappointed. The kingdom is going to come, but not, it hasn't been revealed to you to know when. Yeah. But God will in time reveal that to you. So I think his mission was, was accomplished. And I think that that's a very, very important aspect. Uh, a chap by the name of Alistair McGraw in his book, I Believe, exploring the Apostles' Creed, he makes the following statement. Having come down to earth from heaven to redeem us, Jesus returned to heaven to intercede for us. Mm. He came to earth in humility and he returned to heaven in triumph and glory, in having, accomplished, having accomplished mm. our salvation. Mm. And I think that that's so wonderful, you know, that we are complete the whole work is finished in Christ Jesus. We never need to lose uh, sight of that. We never should lose sight of that wonderful truth. Bruce, I know we often focus and we, we sort of like make a, a comparison between the Lord's first advent, mm. which is born as a baby in the stable, sure. in all of his sort of vulnerability. And so that picture compared to the second advent, uh, coming to judge and, you know, that comparison is made. But I think there's value in also comparing his first advent and his ascension. So in that quote, that's what it brings to mind, mm. is he came in humility, but he left in majesty and in glory. Mm. So in that picture of him ascending in the clouds in his glorified body um, to be with the Father, that's just not the picture that it was when he came. As a baby, Correct. who there was no fanfare, you know, it was the shepherds and the, the animals and the whoever else. Um, so there's a beautiful contrast there in showing that the work was complete. Very much so. And I think that um, remember that the promise was that uh, he would become our intercessor. He would become yeah. our high priest. And therefore, uh, he is our mediator. Yeah. And, and to, to know that we have not only a mediator, but an advocate. I think it is in First, First John, uh, chapter two, verse one, uh, where John actually reminds us that mm. the Lord is our advocate, sure. and to have an advocate simply means somebody who is pleading on our behalf before the court of divine justice. Mm. And 
That is a second reason why the ascension is important to us as believers, is that the Lord is now interceding for us. Mm. So whilst his mission on earth had been accomplished, now that he's in heaven mm. as the ascended Fulfills Lord... Fulfills another role. Right. He's, he's seated on the right hand of the Father. Now this particular thought was not foreign even to the Egyptians and the Romans because mm. the Egyptian pharaohs, when they died, they were considered to be divine and, and, and gods, mm -hmm. and therefore their followers and their subjects believed that they had ascended into the heavens. Mm. They didn't have a full concept of, of the three different stages of heaven. And then you also had the Romans, also believed that mm. their Caesars were gods, and when they died, they were given an ancestral position, a position uh, as yeah. a master of the so-called universe, which unfortunately is a concept that many people still have today. So uh, in their minds, that wasn't a foreign concept. But Jesus rising from the dead um, super, supersedes and, and, and is greater than what the Pharaohs or the Caesars mm. could do. Mm. They witnessed him rising. Nobody witnessed a Pharaoh or a Caesar rising and ascending. So theirs was like theory. Jesus. So the, the, the theory yes. was that now they have ascended, whereas and this was the reality. Correct, and that was the religion and superstition. Yeah. But now this is a reality. So he's in heaven on the right hand of the Father, and he's interceding for us, speaking mm. on our behalf. But besides that, there is a prosecutor. Mm. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. So we don't know all the nuts and bolts of this whole thing, but we do know that according to the book of Job, that the devil comes in the heavenlies mm -hmm. and he throws accusations at God, he throws accusations at God's, at God's people, and he says, look, those people are supposed to be your children. Look at the way they're behaving. Yeah. And, and that he tries to embarrass God by virtue of our lifestyles. Mm. And uh, he accuses us. But Jesus is the one who steps in and says, hang on, their perfection is not based on their performance. Their perfection is based on their position." Mm. and their relationship with me. So the Lord as the advocate, therefore, presents his case. And I can imagine that the enemy, as the prosecutor, throws a lot more um, at accusations at us. And I think that that is a, a wonderful concept, which yeah. is a reality that we need to understand in relation to the ascension. That the ascension reminds us that there is a court, that court case that is actually being conducted, mm -hmm. from our point of view on a daily basis, in eternity, and the time is going to come where the devil and the enemy will be cast out of the heavenlies, and of course he'll be cast down so to earth. So, Bruce, to have, to have an advocate, obviously, of the stature of the Lord Jesus Christ, right. who's Absolutely. representing you, it's, it's beyond right. our thinking. So, you know, we can't even use human or earthly terms to right. try and describe what it would be like because it, not just of the position that we hold, but also because of the purchase price that was paid. So Absolutely. it's it's already a done deal. But how beautiful, because we need to tie this into the next the next point, mm -hmm. is the role of the comforter. So right. where the Lord says, I can't send the comforter mm -hmm. unless I go. Really? So I go first and then I will send the comforter. So we know ascension is 40 days after the, the resurrection. And then we have Pentecost Sunday which is then the coming of the Holy Spirit, which is Pente 50 days yes. after. So it's right. all within that time frame. Right. So the Lord has to ascend mm. so that he can then allow the Holy Spirit mm. to come as prophesied. Right. But now, if you take that to the courtroom and you say, we have an advocate who is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God Almighty, who has paid the price, but he also has personal insight into each of our lives because of the role of the comforter. Correct. So when the devil is coming and making accusations, not only does the Lord say, yeah, but it's paid, so it's their position, not their performance, mm. but also this is something that you don't know because you wouldn't know because it's internal at a depth that you can't understand. Right. So why, is, why did the person make that decision? Well, this is what they're battling with, that they can't even put into words themselves. Mm. But because the comforter is there, he also intercedes on our behalf with those groanings that we cannot utter, can't put into words. I mean, that's just an, that's a beautiful picture. And that, as you say, introduces us to the third reason uh, for the ascension, that comforter could not come unless he had left. Yeah. And Jesus' ascension meant that the Holy Spirit could come 10 days after the ascension. Uh, on that Sunday, first day of the week, 
um, we find that they gathered in the upper room yeah. uh, on the day of Pentecost, a Jewish feast and celebration, and the Holy Spirit comes and empowers them to fulfill their purpose. But what is interesting is that the Greek word that is used there for the Holy Spirit is the word paraklik. Mm. Paraklik. Anything that is para is something that is alongside. Yeah. So the paraklete actually means the Holy Spirit has come to come to our side to give us the assurance. Besides that, to reside within us, but to mm. come to our side to comfort us. And there are so mm. many very, very beautiful caricatures that one can actually use um, to illustrate what that really means. Yeah. You have a paralegal. A paralegal is someone that actually stands beside the advocate or the attorney mm. and carries out a particular role. Mm. Now, in heaven, we've got an advocate in Christ Jesus. On earth, we have, have a, a paralegal, paralegal. <laughs> the paraclete, yeah. who is in actual fact with us and not only walking by our side to comfort us, but residing within us. Yeah. Greater is he who lives within us than any force that is in the world. Isn't mm. that remarkable? So we have that relationship with God because of the Holy Spirit who has sealed us and that giving us the Holy Spirit is like a, a young lady that receives an engagement ring, mm. which is the engagement ring is a promise mm. that the young man will marry her. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee, yes, as an it. engagement ring, assuring us that the marriage will occur mm. soon or one day. And Bruce, um, I think that picture there for the disciples and for all of us as well is a very necessary one. Mm. So I think if you had to ask them, at the time, would you want the Lord to leave? Mm. And I, I can almost guarantee oh, the sure. answer is no. Sure. So, I mean, if your choice is, could you have the Lord Jesus Christ with you here on earth, or would you like him to go? Yeah. And there's an obvious answer. But in his role that he was fulfilling here in his earthly ministry, he was confined by those limitations. Mm. So he could not fulfill the role that the Holy Spirit was going to fulfill, which is... Right to reside within every single believer 100% right. throughout the whole world. Mm. So, yes, the Lord is now no longer on earth, mm. but we have the Holy Spirit. Mm. We have God with us yeah. all over. 100 which, right. when, you, when you're giving, now which one would you really want? <laughs> I think for the disciples, they still would have chosen the one. But uh, I think for everybody else, we'd say, look, we understand yeah. that it, it is a different role. It's, it's wonderful. But that, that is so true. And that is that... Uh, we don't realize that Jesus had limited himself to a body, mm. and therefore he, uh, he could only be in one place at a time. And uh, we know in his, in his pre-incarnate state he was omniscient, and that omniscience means, or omnipresence means, that he was all-knowing and he was all-present. But God is all-present through the Holy Spirit. Mm. Now that the Holy Spirit is residing within us, um, we can say, Jesus lives within me. Because yeah. Jesus is represented by the Holy Spirit who yeah. lives within us. And I think there are so many beautiful illustrations that one can actually use and metaphors and analogies. Yeah. But we race on. You know, Warren, there's another fourth reason why the ascension is important. And that is that there's a meaningful absence that the Bible actually reminds us of in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Mm. To be absent from our physical body, is to be present with the Lord. Mm. And I think that that's a very, very important reason why sure. he ascended. Because we have, as Jesus received Stephen, who was stoned, and when Stephen saw heaven open, and he saw Jesus on the right hand, standing on the right hand, Father, to receive him, mm. we know that we have the promise that the Lord will mm. receive us as well. So to bring comfort to those who have lost loved ones over the past few months and those who have recently lost loved ones, mm. it is wonderful to remind them that to be absent from our physical body mm. means to be present with the Lord. And I think that's, that's so meaningful. Second yeah. Corinthians 5, 8 is a verse that everyone needs to find a tremendous amount of comfort in. That and whole course, section, Bruce, that whole section. from oh, yes. chapter 4, verse 16, chapter four all the way eight, through, it is right. beautiful, but I really think beautiful. That verse, that in particular one, that verse uh, neutralizes all of the arguments that people have about the uh, unconscious state of the soul after yeah. death. 
which is, is, is a concept, which is, is a heresy. It's, it's wrong. It's incorrect. Because we know that immediately when our loved ones leave their physical body, they are present with the Lord. Mm. And the only reason why that can be a reality is because Jesus has ascended. Praise yes. God, he's ascended. And he's waiting for us to receive us into heaven, yeah. which I think is stupendous. Which how again, do you, how yeah. do you explain that? Bruce, again, it's, it's one of those basic practical things mm. that if the Lord was still on earth yeah. and our loved ones die, mm. then you couldn't say that they're going to be with the Lord. That's right. <laughs> because then we're still with the Lord and we're alive. Sure. So it's a real practical, basic thing. But yet the comfort that it brings, and I think not only the comfort to those who have lost loved ones. And as a, as a pastor, Bruce, and I've said this so many times to families, I have no words that I can give you from a human perspective that are going to bring you the comfort compared to what God's word is able to give you. Very much so. what, what can I say humanly? No. Humanly, I've got no answers. No. But when I get to the scriptures sure. and I can say, but this is what the scriptures declare, right. you know, that your loved one is now in the presence of God, it, it completely removes all of that grief and sorrow towards your loved one. Sure. Now you're rejoicing sure. for them. And then you can focus and say, okay, so, so where does my grief fit in? It's, it's focused, yeah, to, towards me, and I can do something about that. Um, but it also brings comfort for the time when we have to face that. Very much so. So, you know, we, we sort of, we, we transpose it to our loved ones who have passed away. Yes. But the reality is that each of us are going to walk that road. Correct. And to know these scriptures and to have that comfort mm. when you are in the valley of the shadow of death. Sure. I mean, Wow. Now, it's a tough one, and I think that, uh, haven't we got it sort of uh, upside down? We celebrate a birth yeah. and mourn a yeah. death. Yeah. Where it's actually should be it the opposite. It really should. We should mourn a birth <laughs> by virtue of the All fact the pain and the trouble oh, and the heartache you know, and the things you're going to have to go through. This is it. And yeah. I think that the older one gets and the longer the gray beard is. That's why you what? celebrate your birthday less. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. But I think from, from, from a, a, a birthing point of view, when, when you see the children coming into the world, the grandchildren, you see them flourish and develop and grow. Yeah. You just don't know what those poor kids are still going to have to face in the world. So there's yeah. a lot that's bad that's going to happen in the world. Yeah. And yet, we thank God that it, it death is. is a celebration. It's not, yeah. a, time, it's not a, a time to mourn. But from, it, from a human point of view, we will mourn. Why? Yes. Because we're going to miss our loved one. Yes. As a matter of fact, the mourning is all about our feelings. Yeah. Because it should not be about the person. Like, no. oh, I feel so sorry they passed away. No, 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 no. Hang on. That's a great victory for them. They have triumphed, they have finished the course, and they have been received home by our the ascended Lord. Lord. That's it. Fantastic. That's it. Bless you all. Mm. So, Bruce, I think um, it's again that paradox. So, you're saying, you know, we should mourn a birthday, mm. but yet there is that natural human rejoicing. Yes. When you see a child, sure. and it is, it's that celebration sure. of, of what it is. Yeah. I think the shift does need to take place on the mourning and the grieving of our loved ones. Yeah. And the thing that I like about that is when you, when you are overly grieving mm. your loved one who has departed, what can you practically do about that? Mm. You can't because they're no longer with you. That's right. So you can't engage with them. You yeah. can't, yeah. it's not there. But when you understand that your mourning is actually for yourself or for the others that are left behind, right. you can practically do something about that. Yes. So you can encourage the other loved ones and you can send them a message or you can reach out and ask for encouragement and say, I'm really battling at the moment. Of course. So that practical understanding of where to direct your grief and your emotions is very important. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the wonderful anticipation that we do have, and that is that even if the final enemy of life, which is death, occurs, that to us it's not a war. It's a doorway. Yeah. It, it is not the end. And often I make the statement that death is not the full stop in the sentence of life. It's a comma. Yeah. Uh, so we pause because we res reflect on our loved one that has left us and we celebrate who they really are. But then we start thinking about ourselves that we look back and we say, oh, there were so many wonderful days and I wish they were back with us. Mm. Hang on. They don't want to be back with us. They, in actual yeah. fact, in heaven, enjoying the wonderful adventure, and I think that is mind-boggling. You know, I, I chuckle when I watch these uh, National Geographic channels, 
and I see men speaking about trying to land on Mars and mm. trying to establish a new uh, community, a new society, and then exploring the universe, and then coming to these great discoveries that there is a black hole and wormholes, mm. where in the universe we're only discovering it now, um, and we didn't know it 100 years ago, and these are great discoveries. Everybody says, wow, man is so clever. God has put it all in place. And therefore, beyond the galaxies, and there's so many galaxies, beyond the suns, of which there are many, moons, and stars, and planets, we have a place called heaven, mm. where our loved ones are. And they are adventuring into the universe. I don't know about you, but I, I love watching these um, explorations into the sea. I mean, on our planet, we haven't yeah. seen everything yet. No. There's still things to discover in yeah. the sea. But beyond our planet, there's so many beautiful things to see. And I think that we've got a lot of work to do in heaven. It's not going to be just sitting playing our harps. Uh, not that I would like to play the harp. But we're going to be doing so much. Yeah. Because we're going to be joining God's incredible enterprise of the universe um, and playing a role that some of the angels have never played. What a wonderful promise we have. All made possible because our Lord ascended. Yeah. So, Bruce, when I say that it is mind-blowing, it would almost imply that I could conceptualize it and then it blows my mind. Yeah. And the problem with this, <laughs> you can't even get it into your mind. Yeah. And that's why we have the example of Paul, the apostle, mm. who saw what that third heaven was like. Mm. And what, 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 what did he say? Sure. So, if we have to ask our loved ones, would you want to return or would you want to stay there? Well, Paul answers that for us. Mm. And he says... I can't wait to leave. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. I just, I it's want, better that I stay here for you. For your sake, <laughs> yes, but I yes. can't wait to leave. Correct. Because, and then he says that he can't even talk about what he has seen because human words can't explain it. So it's, it's that excitement that our loved ones are experiencing right wow. now. Wow. And it's the joy for them to be <laughs> able to, to yes. know that. Yes, yes. Yeah. Wonderful. And you know, Warren, the, the fifth and final uh, reason for the it's a big one. It's a big one. <laughs> is, is a very big one. I mean, we could possibly run a series just on this one, yeah. the fifth reason, and that is the messianic appearance. Yeah. The Old Testament prophets had prophesied of a utopian era. A time would come where the lion will lie down with the lamb. And also, men would turn their swords into plowshares. That has not happened in human history, but it is something that's going to happen in the future. God has given us some insight of how it's going to happen, mm. but not all the details. Mm. And the wonderful thing about the ascension is that the promise that was given by the two messengers, that the same Jesus that mm. has ascended will descend. He's coming yeah. back again. Isn't that remarkable? He's coming back again. And I think that there are two parallel passages, one in the Old Testament and the other in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And Warren, you may want to read that one from Zechariah 14, uh, verse 1 through to 4. Um, Can we read yeah, it here, Bruce? 14, 1 through to 4. And then there's also another verse there, and I think it is verse 16. But uh, let's have a look at that. Yeah. Zechariah 14 from verse 1. I know that we're going to have it on our screen at the back as well. Sure. But I think, let me just get it here. Zechariah. Oh, he's coming back again, folks, and I think that that's exciting. But his return is going to be a, a twofold return. The one section of it, he returns not to the earth, but to the heavenlies. Mm. And uh, we are caught up to meet him in the air, which is First Thessalonians chapter 4. And then, of course, Zechariah 14 and Revelation 19 is the parallel passages. So it's Zechariah 14 and Revelation 19. So, so let me read, read it that. from Zechariah. Behold, yes. the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And we're going to take it through to verse 4. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley, 
Half of the mountain shall move towards the north and half of it towards the south. Hmm. And when that happens, it's going to be like an earthquake. Yeah. And when, when the Mount of Olives splits, Jerusalem presently is not a port city. Mm. It's, it's uh, uh, landlocked, unfortunately. So there's, there's, they haven't got a port city. They use Gaza um, mm. and, of course, other, other sections. But what is interesting there is that Jerusalem is going to become a port city. Yeah. And so that valley that it's re uh, speaking about is obviously going to make way for a sea that will eventually be part of uh, Jerusalem. Yeah. But the interesting thing is that the nations will be gathered against Jerusalem. Many folks have actually looked at this, uh, it's called the historicist. Those who look at the book of Revelation and mm. the end times historically and say, no, it already happened. It happened in 70 AD when um, the Romans under uh, Titus, Titus, General Titus, um, when Titus the Roman general besieged Jerusalem, that is when there was this reference to Zechariah. To Zechariah. Mm. But it has nothing to do with that because mm. the Lord didn't go out and fight against the nations then. Yeah. And, uh, the Mount of Olives wasn't split in half. Uh, correct. So there were many, many physical things that did not happen. Yeah. It's going to happen when the Lord comes back again. Yeah. So I think just to give folks a better understanding of it, um, the return of Christ is twofold. The promise that was made when he ascended was that he'll come back again to earth. Yeah. However, the Lord through the revelation and this beautiful mystery that he gives to the Apostle Paul. That the disciples had no idea no, about no when idea. he was speaking to them Correct. about that. He speaks of the coming of the Lord and meeting us in the air and we shall ever be with the Lord. Mm. Then there's a seven year period of tribulation that follows. After the seven years, Jerusalem is besieged and surrounded by the nations. And that's where you get then, to Zechariah. Correct. And of course, Revelation 19 also gives an account that the Lord mm. will uh, descend. And mm. it's speaking about that very, very promise. So, so Bruce, incredible. for us, for us now as believers uh, and members of the body of Christ, our hope is not earthly. It's not the establishment of the kingdom. Our focus is not trying to establish God's kingdom here no, 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 on right, earth, which right. is what the disciples were doing, sure. and rightly so. Sure. And all of the promises that the Lord made to them specifically yeah. will come to pass. Right. But we are given a different hope. Sure. And that hope, as you've said, was revealed to the Apostle Paul sure. as the mystery. Sure. So that hope, it completely changes the focus. Very much so. So instead of the earthly focus, we now focus towards the heavens. Correct. And again, where the scriptures say, we set, we fix our eyes on things above from whence our Savior comes. Correct. Because that's, he's coming to, to sure. take us home. Sure. So that shift in focus is also so important because it, it unravels so much of the confusion within right. Christianity. That's, that's a fact. And I think that today you'll find, which is very sad, a big emphasis being placed on let's spread the kingdom. Let's, let's, yeah. let's, uh, preach the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom gospel was what the 12 carried out. Yeah. And at that stage, they did not know that the kingdom was going to be suspended, but they carried, carried it out. Think, what is God going to do when he removes us? Who's going to spread the message of the kingdom? That's it. We have 144,000 witnesses, Revelation chapter 7. Mm. So you have um, 12 disciples times 12,000, 144,000 mm. witnesses mm. who will be preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. The very message that Jesus preached in his earthly ministry yeah. and John the Baptist and yeah. the 12, they yeah. preached that. Now, that they're going to be the evangelists. And I believe that the Lord is preparing a messianic group mm. uh, and sealing them. The Bible says they will be sealed and 144,000 of them will be preaching the true message of the kingdom, unlike yes. what we're hearing today with this prosperity cult. What I think is important, therefore, is we as believers are um, not witnesses in that sense. We are ambassadors. Correct. And being Christ's ambassadors, we draw attention to our hope in heaven. The kingdom is drawing attention to the hope on earth. That's it. Because it's, it's Jewish-related and the nations, all the other nations, will, be, will benefit 
from the rise of the nation of Israel mm. and God's kingdom being established. And verse 16, Warren, in Zechariah 14, says something fantastic. What will happen with those nations? Let's read it. What will happen to those nations after the Lord establishes his kingdom on the earth? Verse 16 of Zechariah 14 says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of of tabernacles. Wow. Isn't that incredible? All the other nations will in actual fact see Israel with their king, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, And they will come up annually, an annual celebration, to just observe this man sure. of history, the one who ascended and descended and has brought in the promises that the Old Testament has made, and that is the kingdom of God on earth, utopia for a thousand years. Magnificent. Bruce, I wonder if I can just illustrate this quickly, because I think this to me is one of the most important aspects of understanding the difference between an earthly hope and a heavenly hope. Sure. So the important part is if our focus was the earthly kingdom, our expectation would be earthly, earthly okay, but also that it's going to get better. Mm. So we're going to spread this and it's going to be a revival sure. and things are going to get better and better and better and the Lord's going to return. That's right. And that is often the concept that many believers have and they're sincere in that, but they, they, their belief is just... It's, um, it's, it's, it's very grounded yes. Yes, <laughs> in the wrong sense grounded, because it's earthly. Right. Very earthly. <laughs> very earthly. <laughs> but for us, when we understand that, hang on, what the scriptures say is we're not expecting this earthly kingdom to be established, that things are going to get better. Mm. The Lord very clearly says that things are going to get worse mm. within this world. And that's why our hope is heavenly. Sure. So we, our expectation is not that things are going to get better, but that doesn't make us pessimists. Yes. I mean, that makes us enthusiasts <laughs> because good, it means our time is running out. Sure. The more we can see that things are getting worse, mm. the less time we have mm. to be able to really to get this message out of hope Wonderful. because that's what it is. And, and I think that people are beginning to ask a lot of questions yeah. about the future. And uh, one would think that they should have been asking those questions long ago. But when you have a crisis like the world has gone through and is presently going through, and I'm sure there are going to be many other crises that are going to come our way, um, the Lord will use that. God doesn't cause it to happen, but he allows it to happen. And what, when these tragedies happen and the world faces a crisis, that the Bible says eventually people will curse God. Mm -hmm. Instead of turn to God, they turn away from God. So whilst the door of grace is actually open, we should be sharing this message with confidence and enthusiasm. Mm. Not only encouraging each other as believers, but telling our folks uh, that are our relatives and our friends and our neighbors, sharing with them the fact that there is a greater promise beyond this, and the Lord is going to come back. And uh, I feel so sorry for youngsters who actually are afraid. Some children are afraid of hearing about the coming of Jesus because they've been told and they've heard that when Jesus comes back, it's the end of the world. Yeah. It's the end of the world as we knew it, but not the end of the world because there'll be a thousand years of peace that mm. is still awaiting this planet. So the Lord's going to sew up the crack in the ozone layer, sort it yeah. all out, and I think the promise is found in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Incredible mm. passages mm. that remind us of a utopian era that will come. So Bruce, so today... Today, we are celebrating the ascension of the Lord for those five reasons. And each of those has personal impact and relevance Mm -hmm. to us in our faith, but I think importantly to our view of the future because that's, that's really where our focus needs to be. So as much as what we say, we're facing the crisis and we're dealing with all of these things, and it's temporary, so this is not our eternal destiny. Yep. So, much so we, and yet, God in his grace and in his wisdom is able to use these circumstances to fashion us, to shape us, to mold us, to change us in the areas that are necessary for each of us 
for our eternal destiny. And I mean, that's, so then, then we start, we start saying, we just start echoing what Paul says, I glory in my tribulations. Yes, yes. Like, I, I, I rejoice yes. in the difficulties that I have. That's right. Because it's teaching me lessons. Instead of making me hopeless and despondent, yes. I'm saying, wow, yes. what is God going to show me through this? Correct. How am I going to grow and change? And what am I going to learn? Yes. And, and that shift in focus hmm. is, is what is necessary. Correct. So those who are unbelievers, uh, their hope, which is a very earthly, worldly it's hope. It's terrible. When they when see you look it at actually this. folding, why is God doing this? Yeah, no, this why it's is terrible. God doing this? It makes so no sense. Correct. But our hope is a promise. And the Lord says, when all these things happen, what things? Christ mm. sees come. Mm. Look up for your redemption is drawing, drawing near. near. Now, many folks will accuse us who believe in the rapture, which is the Greek word, a puzzle, which is a mm. snatching away. Many folks actually will refer to our doctrinal belief as being a rescue mentality. Mm. Oh, God is going to send a helicopter and rescue you guys mm. when you're facing disaster. Well, what does the word salvation mean? Salvation yeah. means rescue. Yeah. And therefore, the rapture is a rescue. He's going to save us from the wrath and the judgment of God that is to come upon the earth during the mm. seven years of tribulation. And that's why... We need to look up and know that our redemption is a lot closer than when we first believed and therefore hold on to that promise. And so Bruce, you know what my prayer is? My prayer is that as we understand this, the more we understand it, mm. the more we appreciate what God has done mm. and what he promises he will do, the more comfort it will bring and the more it will energize us. Very much so. To do the work that the Lord has called us to do. 100% right. Whilst we still can. Right. So if I can summarize it, do you mind me summarizing Please, it? Please, go right ahead. So let's wrap it up now because it's been wonderful having you chat. And I've been peeping down on this uh, uh, contraption here and I see all the hearts and all the messages that are coming in. That's really, very, very kind of you. You've been very, very gracious. And thank you for setting this time aside to hear the word of God. But in summary, remember... Christ ascended to heaven. He is now our advocate. The Holy Spirit resides in us as the comforter. And the Lord has re will receive us when we should leave this earth. And he is coming back again. Those are the five definite positive reasons why the ascension is a worthy day to consider mm. these beautiful truths. And it's fantastic that you've joined us. We look forward to really seeing you all, as Warren says, speaking in a church with empty pews is certainly not inspiring. But look what has happened. <laughs> yeah. In God's providence, we have this particular medium whereby we are able to actually speak to everyone. Yeah. Now, isn't it incredible, Warren, that we are, we are separate but not divided? Yeah. Hey? Yeah, that's beautiful. We, we are separate but not divided. Because we are united in Christ, wherever we mm. may be, God's Spirit lives in you and me and in every one of you. And because he does, we have a lot to celebrate. So mm. it's been fantastic. And I, I trust that you will enjoy the weekend and um, tune into the live streaming for uh, uh, Sunday. That's also yeah. going to be very, very special. And uh, those messages can be life transforming. So folks, we, let's get excited about the way in which God is working. And please make the very, very best of a worse situation that you are facing. God be with you. And well said, us. well said. So Bruce, on that note, I want to share with everybody that this Sunday we're starting our new series and the, seri the series is entitled Stay Positive, but we sort of subtitled it almost uh, Be Contagious, mm. which is... Um, <laughs> <laughs> a contagion, very relevant. It's a little bit punny. <laughs> yes. uh, but the whole purpose of that is for us to be able to look at the situation from God's perspective. Mm. And when we do, and we are able to see the work that God does in the midst of difficult times, you start celebrating. Absolutely. You start glorying in your tribulations like Paul. Very and so. that spirit, that spirit of joy and of contentment, that spirit of understanding that there's so much more that God is doing, that spirit is contagious. Sure. So when others see you and they say, but hang on, why are you not so down and glum? And why are you not <laughs> battling with this? How can you be enjoying this? And, yes, you know, yes. and this week, our first one is enough of the bad news. Yes. Enough of the bad news. Correct. Because this is good news. 
Wonderful. The gospel is good news. Wow. Powerful. And this is opening the doors mm. to the gospel like we cannot imagine. Incredible. And then how do we get depressed about that? Yeah, it, and right. we say, Lord, right. just continue using sure. us. So this Sunday um, at our normal time, half past nine, and I want to encourage you, please start using our church online platform. Mm. So we have, it's really, really great to be able to see all of the interaction and to see the hearts and, and everything else that is there. So as you give those hearts, it really does inspire um, and it encourages and motivates us. Yeah. Just that, that little bit of feedback. So we, we, we look forward to it. Um, Bruce, I have one word, Maranatha. Yes. So Maranatha is a word that is used, yes. um, and it, it's Lord come quickly. Come quickly, correct. But it's, it's not a common word. No. But I want to encourage you to, to write that word in our comments. And I'm going to be the first one, just in case you're worried about the spelling. So, Maranatha. Lord come quickly. Lord come quickly. It was a wonderful greeting that many of the disciples and the early Christians used to greet each other with the word Maranatha. That's it, now. because what that does, Bruce, is it instantly mm. shifts your focus mm. from all of your worldly problems and the things that are happening here yeah. to, Lord, come quickly. Correct. Because that's where our hope and, is. And the, and the scriptures, like we're going to start another series now. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the scriptures actually tell us that we purify our hearts. In other words, we keep our hearts focused on things that are pure when we anticipate the Lord's arrival. That's it. If I knew Jesus is coming back today... Man. There's lots of things you are yeah, going to do. I'm not going to waste time. A lot time, of eh? things you're not so, going to do. Correct, correct. Yeah. So, Warren, I'd like to shake your hand and thank you for this opportunity. But we, we, can, do an we can do an elbow. There we go. <laughs> thank you, Bruce. God what a blessing. You, folks. Well done to you. Yeah. We love you lots. You're we very special and dear to us. That we conclude in prayer. So, would you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you for this very special time together. Thank you that we can gather around your word and that we can be encouraged and inspired by the incredible promises that you have given. But Father, as, as we look forward to the future, we look forward to that hope that we have, we also cast an eye back to what you have done for us, that our faith is built not on empty promises. It's not built on theories and philosophies. Father, that our faith is built on the resurrection of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is something worth giving our lives for. Praise the Lord. Father, may we continue to honor you in our decisions on a daily basis, that we would love you with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, and that we would love the people around us, not with a worldly love that loves those who love them, but that we would love with a godly love, Amen. a love that loves their enemies. Right. And so, Father, we ask as we give you praise and surrender our lives to you, that your work would continue. And we say together, Maranatha. Maranatha. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Bruce. Thank and you, thank Warren. you all.